Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Open Society Foundation's discussion on quality education for climate action. Many thanks for joining us today. My name is Iveta Silova, and I am a member of the Education Programs Advisory Board and professor at Arizona State University. I'll be moderating that discussion today. The discussion has been organized as part of a three-day program focusing on climate action leading up to the Earth Day, which will be celebrated tomorrow on April 22nd. Earth Day was first celebrated in 1970, marking the birth of the global environmental movement that aims to elevate the environmental consciousness and puts environmental concerns on the front page. Today's Earth Day program was organized by our close partner, Education International, the Global Union Federation of Teachers Trade Unions, who launched their Teach for the Planet campaign in the Education International Manifesto on Quality Climate Change Education for All. How this host, Education International's Deputy Director General, is with us today to say a few words about these initiatives. And after that, Camila Croso, Director of the Education Program at Open Society Foundations, will welcome you to this event and introduce our web discussion topic. How this wonderful to have you with us today, and over to you. Thank you very much, Iveta, and welcome to all viewers. At first, I'd like to thank our partner, the Open Society Foundations, who has been a long-standing ally to teachers in our advocacy for a more just society and for organizing this event and for the invite to take part. As Iveta mentioned, this is an important, I would always say, momentous day for Education International since we have just, through a three-hour online broadcast, launched our campaign for climate change education, Teach for the Planet. The campaign is guided by our newly adopted manifesto for quality change education for all, which outlines the profession's vision for climate change education to be provided universally to all students at all levels of education. The manifesto emphasizes that all students have a right to climate change education. All students have a right to gain the knowledge, skills and attitudes necessary to sustain our world for present and future generations. And all students have the right to receive an education which prepares them for the world of work in a green economy. Therefore, our main call as Education International is that to all governments that they must include climate change in their nationally determined contributions to COP26 and to make and implement time-bound plans to provide climate change education for all. There are countries that have shown that it is possible and today we will be hearing about the bold steps taken by Italy to be at the forefront of climate change education internationally. Other countries must follow suit. Some have started, and we've just heard about it the last three hours, but there are so many more countries we need to get on board. After all, if the governments across the world are going to meet their international commitments to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 4 for quality education for all, then climate change education must happen. There isn't a moment to lose. We need to move forward. So I'm so much looking forward to listening to the conversation in this event. And I'd like to hand over to Camilla Croso, the director of OSF Education Programme, to bring us further. Thank you ever so much, Halda. Thank you ever so much, Aveta, for, for starting our panel. We are just so honored to be holding this event in the context of EI Summit and launch of the Teach for the Planet campaign. I want to introduce a little bit more Aveta as well. Aveta Silova is a board member of OSF's education program, and she is also the current president of the Comparative and International Education Society, CIS, that will have their annual conference in just one, under one week. 
Yvette is a professor and a director of the Center for the Advanced Studies in Global Education at the Arizona State University and has been leading education discussions at the intersection of education, climate, biodiversity, ecofeminism, and the futures. Friends and colleagues who are with us today, welcome to our Quality Education for Climate Action panel. Climate education is an, is an important priority for OSF's education program. We acknowledge the urgency of contributing to the overcoming of the climate emergency we are facing across all continents. Far too long, climate education has been fundamentally absent of the education, public and policy debates, and we call on both state and non-state actors to give it the deserved attention, space, and understanding its relation to increased levels of social, economic, and environmental well-being and justice. As Haldis really put it so well, we are all advocating for the implementation of SDG 4, advocating for the implementation of SDG 4 vis-a-vis -vis the other SDGs. And we all know that the SDGs are articulating people and planet. However, climate education has been absent until now, or not so present or very insufficiently present from the policy debate of education. I just want to highlight that climate education, from our understanding, pertains to both formal and informal education, and that it must come hand in hand with fostering an, an education that is promoting critical thinking, that is promoting interrogation, that is fostering exercise of citizenship, that is fundamentally interlinked to the strengthening of democracies and human rights, and that is committed to action and change at individual and systemic levels. It goes well beyond subjects, topics, information. It is really about embedding this conversation within a human rights perspective, within a strengthened democracy perspective, within an understanding that we as human beings are part of the natural world and that we have a shared commitment and responsibility towards it and towards all peoples inhabiting the planet. This year poses an excellent opportunity to elevate attention and political will to climate education with COP26 just around the corner, taking place at the end of the year. And we really hope governments will step up and include climate education in their national commitments and subsequently take this debate back home and into policymaking at the country level, engaging broadly with its people, especially teachers, students, women, youth, and those living in rural and climate change vulnerable areas. And it really is a great pleasure for me to introduce our two guests today. And we will have a very lively conversation. We hope to take this forward, uh, this panel forward in a dialogical manner. And we have here with us Lorenzo Fioramonti, former Italian Minister of Education, who introduced climate education through civic engagement in Italian schools and who, in 2019, and the COP 2019, called on all countries to commit to climate education by COP 26, including it in the National Determined Contributions. He is a political scientist and professor of polit political economy at the University of Pretoria and associate fellow of the Center for the Study of Governance Innovation. And we also have with us Janelle Tomlinson, youth activist and founder of Young People for Action on Climate Change and she is a UN Youth Delegate and member of the Caribbean Youth Environment Network in Jamaica. She is a doctoral student at the University of West Indies. So thank you very, very much for joining us today, and I'm looking forward to the conversation ahead of us. Over to you, Aveta. Thank you so much, Camilla, for these introductions. Um, but before we begin, I wanted to let everybody know that if you have a question, if you would like to raise a question for the discussion, the best way to do is, is via Twitter. And you can do that um, by um, with a tag at OSF Education. But let's start with our discussion. So these introductions were great, Camilla, but Janelle and Lorenzo, because both of you have such fascinating backgrounds, I'd like to start by asking if you could tell us a little bit more about your personal journeys into the climate space advocacy work. For Janelle, this is a journey into the youth climate movement, and for Lorenzo, um, a move into politics. 
what were your motivations and inspirations and how have uh, they been shaped both by the specific context within which you both work, that is the Caribbean for Janelle and Italy for Lorenzo, and perhaps by some of the global politics. Janelle, can we start with you? Tell us more about yourself and what led you to establishing Young People for Action on Climate Change. What did you hope to achieve? Uh, thank you so much, Iveta, for that question. And thank you also to Lorenzo, you know, for agreeing to share this space with me. So, um, so climate change pretty much is something that has always been, you know, reiterated during our studies, during our research, but it wasn't something I was immersed in. So Young People for Action on Climate Change Jamaica is supposed to be a space for young people to have dialogue, to have conversations, to connect with other existing youth groups within Jamaica, across the Caribbean. And again, to focus on rural youth, you know, as one of those groups that are often exempted and not necessarily incorporated in a conversation. So YPAC, which is the abbreviation for um, our group, is to really create that space for rural youth to be able to use a host of different expressions. So art and craft, music, dance, storytelling, to tell what they think climate change is and how they think they can contribute to um, those sort of solutions that we need to see. And again, it's taking an inclusive approach to kind of climate change um, empowerment and education, because again, youth are a constituent, according to the UN, um, in these climate change conversations. But oftentimes, what they see it as is tokenism, so they don't think that they're actively being engaged. So what we hoped for through our group was to provide that space for engagement. And again, through my research, I saw it fit because uh, whatever I do, I try to you know, be as immersive as I can. So for me, it was a very, um, it, it came naturally for me to get involved with climate change because my research was already based on that I'm looking at rural spaces. So I think that was how I got into it. And that was the idea behind launching on um, this specific group. Thanks so much, Janelle, Whoa. for these beginnings. Lorenzo, so it's over to you, but maybe just a quick prompt. It's incredible that Italy has become the world's first country to make it compulsory for school children to study climate change and sustainable development, thanks largely to your efforts. So can you tell us more what led you to that point? Sure. Um, to you. Thank you so much, Aveta. I'd like to thank Open Society Foundations and everyone who is watching us now. Um, to your first question, what got you started? Um, I got involved in politics because I was tired. I was tired of being an academic, writing books and writing papers, and I thought that time was not on our side. We don't have time for se time for seminars anymore. Sorry, I, you know, I'm, I know I'm speaking to a student and a fellow academic, but somehow I think we need that realization that time is running uh, running away. And so when I got offered the possibility of running for office, I took it without even questioning it. Um, and within a few months, I was the, initially the deputy minister of education. And I took this job. I thought if I could do one thing that would have systemic impact, that would be changing our education model. I thought that we are teaching the wrong things at school. I'm still thinking that, you know, the school curricula have to change. And of course, looking at all those millions of students taking to the streets and protesting and basically saying something. We don't want to go to school if you know, the world is not going to continue. So what's the point of going to school? And I thought, well, you know, it's, you know, we need schools to start talking about reality, to start talking about the most incredible challenge we're facing. And, and I was given the opportunity as a deputy minister to propose what to do. And I did it in this way. I thought we need to change our civic education. Our civic education cannot be about vague, a vague understanding of rights and responsibilities done in a very pedantic way. It needs to be lively. It needs to be practical. It needs to be able to make students participate in understanding what it means to be a responsible citizen in the 21st century. And so putting the environment and putting our connection with everything that is around us, with our social and natural ecosystems at the core of a new vision of civic education, which is exactly what we did. We designed a new module which takes that into account. It starts from the relationship between us as human beings and everything else and society and nature and starts building a very pragmatic project oriented way of teaching this in a collaborative fashion, starting from grade one all the way to the end of high school. And, and I'm really happy that we were the first country in the world and we could actually inspire other countries like New Zealand and Mexico. And now I hope this year many more after the G20 
which is going to take place in Italy at the end of June, and then the COP, first the, the youth COP in Milan, and then the COP in Glasgow, Scotland. Thanks, Lorenzo, for this. But let's talk about the role of education and the role it plays in the climate crisis a little bit more. Education is, in a way, a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it is promoted as a magic bullet that will help us solve the climate crisis. So, for example, it's very central to the sustainable development goals. But on the other hand, we all know that the type of education we currently have is highly problematic, and you already alluded to it. So, in fact, many would say that education itself, at least the type of education we currently practice, is at the root of the problem. So, think about that. The world is the most educated it has ever been in history, but it's closest to the environmental collapse. So, what do you think must change um, about how we think about education and where do we start? And, Lorenzo, maybe I'll um, bounce it back to you because you are a political economist by training. And from your perspective, um, oh, for how do we? One of the one of the problems is that education is linked so very directly to the logic of economic growth, prioritizing workforce supply for environment over environmental concerns. So, as a political economist, do you see a way out? Do you see a way of decoupling education from this logic of economic growth somehow? Absolutely. Um, I mean, um, let me say this. Over the past 10 years, uh, before becoming a politician, I was a political economist and I wrote books like this, The Well-Being Economy, Success in the World Without Growth. So um, my entire academic work was based on rethinking what we mean by economic growth and rethinking our economic model because I think that all our problems, whether it's inequalities, whether it's ecosystem destruction, originate from a misunderstanding. Development cannot be associated with destruction. If you think you can develop as a society out of destruction, you got it wrong. And I know that this is not palatable to a lot of politicians around the world, but here we are. I became a minister by saying precisely this. So there is hope for everyone. We can start a new language. We can start a new narrative. So what we did in Italy was, um, as I said, to change how we study the climate, how we study ourselves, how we study ecosystems in society from the very first beginning of schooling um, at age six, all the way through. First, the module changes as the students progress, right? It's very simple, it's very proactive at the beginning, it becomes more sophisticated as you move along. But also, we change the way in which we do academic work at universities. The first year in Italy now, out of 80% 80, 80 of our universities now, are um, providing freshmen with a cross-cutting, transversal, cross-cutting mainstream course on sustainability, which is the same whether you're going to become a doctor, whether you're going to become a biologist, whether you're going to become an economist, whether you're going to become a sociologist. Everyone needs to understand how his or her discipline fits within the bigger scheme of things. We cannot, we don't want to train economists that are full, completely ignorant about the biosphere. We don't want to train engineers that don't know anything about society and, you know, build buildings that are not pleasant to live in or infrastructure that is not in harmony with nature. We don't want to have, so all the disciplines and the specializations are good, but they have somehow to share a common understanding of what it means to be a responsible person in a finite planet. And so we change that as well. And I think if we start doing that, it's not sufficient, it's a start. We gradually positively contaminate the entire education curriculum. I think that is the ultimate goal, right? It's not just to add one hour per week, which is what we do in Italian schools now, talking about climate change and what students can do to address climate change, but it's about changing how we study science, changing how we study mathematics, changing how we study sociology and how we study anything. So if we do that, then schools and, and academic institutions may very well become laboratories of transformation. And I can tell you this from the research we've done, if we, have, if we can reach students, you reach billions of families. And when you reach billions of families and you change their attitudes and behaviors, you immediately change um, a planetary, you affect the planetary process. So when people think about, they think about education, they think that education can only have an effect in the long term. That is wrong. It has a tremendously transformative effect in the long term. 
but also a very good one, an important one immediately in the short term. And according to our estimates, it may actually be even more um, impactful than technological transformation. When you change the behavior of billions of people, you see the effects, the positive effects on the environment, on personal consumption, on lifestyles immediately. And this has a dramatically positive impact. Thanks, Lorenzo. Janelle, over to you. Tell us a little bit more about the uh, context in the Caribbean and what do you see as kind of the main challenges and issues in education there? You know, Lorenzo said something just now and it, you know, it stuck with me. He said that, you know, by empowering students, you empower families and in empowering families, you know, you create behavioral change. And that is something that we have been advocated for as well, something that, you know, has been at the forefront of a lot of our actions and activities. So I just needed to point that out that I'm totally in agreement with that statement. And I think it, it, it just hit me. I was like, wow, yes, yes, that is exactly what we're saying. So to respond to your question, I think so education has, uh, particularly when we think about students, it has been, you know, through a lot of formal mechanisms. So getting into the classroom and, you know, um, utilizing the chalk and talk, as we call it, kind of process. So for us, there are a lot of students who don't necessarily, um, what would I say, absorb information that way. And I don't think as much uh, effort has been put into looking into alternative sort of mechanisms for, you know, relaying information. So for us, I work a lot with farmers and so to switch on to maybe older persons, we have in fact recognized that, you know, these formal ways of, you know, providing pamphlets, of, you know, giving out booklets has not necessarily provided the kind of information that we want, particularly when we're trying to promote climate smart um, kind of mechanisms. So what we have had to do as a result is to do um, and utilize what we call the pharma field school approach, which is a learn by doing. So you take them into the field, you have them, you know, learn from each other. The idea of traditional knowledge is incorporated. So I do think that while a lot of formal sort of avenues are being utilized now for both, say, farm uh, adults and uh, younger persons, I think based on the experiences we've had and the lessons we've learned, there has to be alternatives which are a little bit more informal. So how do we use storytelling? How do we use music? How do we take into context, you know, the cultural aspects? When there's a song, when there's a jingle, kids learn it so quickly. So how then do we use those as methods to provide and incorporate information, particularly about the climate? I mean, we are the ones inheriting a future. And we are the ones who are going to have to deal with whatever repercussions come from, you know, uh, climate change. So then how do we ensure that we equip the future generation with the relevant information, utilizing methods that they are going to consider, you know, important? A lot of times when we are doing our events, or when we are trying to have campaigns, we have to take into consideration that youth especially, they have very short um, time out. Uh, spans of focus. So whatever we're doing, it has to be very animated. It has to be very, you know, immersive. So we try to utilize these different mechanisms to make sure that whatever message we're putting across, they get it. They get it. And we utilize, um, as I said before, music, songs, drama, storytelling. So for me, we have to look at persons where they are, look at the resources that they have, look at how um, they learn, and then try to see how best we use those sorts of avenues and incorporate those sort of things to make sure that the, the information is passed on and passed on the most effective way. That's wonderful. Actually, I would like to, if we can talk a little bit more about the role of um, informal or non-formal education, it would be wonderful. Janelle, I think in your work, you also talk about this idea of school without walls, yes. approach to climate education. Maybe you yes. can tell us a little bit more about it and why do you think it's important? But also, I wanted to push even further and ask, um, can we imagine um, education making a shift where we'll learn not only from school and university teachers and professors, but also from other human beings in our lives, from parents, from community members, from maybe ancestors, and perhaps even from more than human world around us, including learning from and with nature. Can, um, what do you think about that? I'm totally in agreement. So the schools without walls approach um, is pretty much the field school that I mentioned earlier. And it's a way how we have sought to, you know, utilize persons um, existing knowledge and to see, okay, so 
if you wanted to learn about a particular thing, what method do you think would be useful? And they tell us, okay, music, okay, storytelling. And for me, I think it's important because, you know, it, persons learn from each other. And we've um, incorporated this idea of peer-to-peer -peer learning as well, where you use your uh, regular dialect. So it's not very formal where you have to, you know, be using the standard English. Um, again, we use a host of different videos. We use um, demonstrations. So persons have that kind of experiential um, learning process going on. And it's something that I know they have been trying to incorporate with younger children as well. So I do know that in some um, schools, they have what they would call a break time. And during that break time, the kids go on the outdoors and the teacher tries to, you know, be out there in nature. So they sit under a tree, they form a circle under a tree, they pinpoint different things that they see. OK, so I see a leaf, I see whatever it is, and they kind of build stories and conversations around these things in nature as well. So I do think that while it is not something that is currently being prioritized or something that is um, seen on a large scale, Slowly, we do see where some teachers are trying to incorporate that in their teaching because they see where this kind of interaction and, you know, being in certain spaces does stimulate the, um, the young person's ideas of wanting to be uh, more engaged and, you know, better involved. And to me, I think it also helps them to learn more because, again, they are fully immersed. They're excited. They want to hear from their friends. They want to show their friends. So for us, that is quite um, important. How do we um, incorporate these um, other more non-formal avenues? Again, I'm going to speak a lot about farmers and particular young farmers because I work a lot with them. And when you hear from them and they tell you that, you know, a lot of the um, knowledge that I have about farming is from my grandmother, it's from my grandfather, it's, you know, growing up, I have seen how they have uh, done different things. So for me, these persons play a very critical role in more rural communities, you know, where elders hold these um, uh, power and authority and who are respected. Again, when they are able to convey information, again, utilize the regular language, regular dialect, the idea of storytelling as well, it is quite important. And because they already have that level of respect, because persons already look to them for information, then they become even more important actors, you know, in the space where climate information is concerned. But if we are going to have them as persons relating the information, firstly, we have to ensure that the information that they have is in fact correct, because I have seen in some instances where there have been challenges, where there have been challenges with fake news, where you know persons have certain ideas that they hold true to, and then they end up spreading misinformation. So for that to be important as well, we have to ensure that whatever is being conveyed is in line with the kind of messaging that we want to put across. So yes, totally for informal, totally for incorporating you know elders and respected persons, but it has to be done correctly. Lorenzo. Do you see approaches like this? Uh, do you see any chance of approaches like this being incorporated in the curriculum, in the formal curriculum in particular, especially in the context where countries are driven by this competitiveness, especially in rankings on global scales through PISA and TIMS and all kinds of other st uh, global student achievement testing? So how can those um, who exist in the same environment. Look, I see a lot of room for all types of innovation, and I think knowledge has no boundaries, and there is not one person who can say, oh, I am knowledge, you're not. And and this is just as true, you know, when we're talking at, you know, I imagine Chanel, the Caribbean and that part of the world, or Africa, I lived 20 years in Africa before coming back to my native country. And, and I've seen it in, in Italy as well, right? We have, there is, um, I think, you know, pedagogues and, and, and the scholars of education know very well that, you know, knowledge has no boundaries, that there are different ways of learning, and that in today's society, we get, we acquire information everywhere. You know, we acquire information in school, we acquire information outside. One, one of the things that we wanted to emphasize with this new module on climate change and sustainability was precisely that. The point of this module is not to tell you what the climate science says. You know, we, partly we do that already, in geography, in science. The point of this module is to empower you to do something with it, right? So how do you learn a, your connection with your community? You know, often we go to school and we're completely separate from the, from the world in which we live. You know, very few schools are actively engaged with their own communities. Very few kids that go to school know precisely what is the impact 
of a number of things on on the people that they know, on their neighbors, on on other people from their own uh, neighborhood, and so on and so forth. So it's 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 mostly about connecting the dots, if you know what I mean, right? So it's mostly connect. It's about taking the information that is already out there and providing students with an opportunity to become protagonists and say, what can we do with this information? Connecting the dots, I think, is the most important education activity these days. We have a lot of segmented or information. You know, we know everything about one little part of the bigger picture and we ignore completely what's out there. You know, this sort of learned autism is becoming a major problem. I think, Iveta, you and I work in academic institutions and we know so well how many smart academics are complete idiots on many issues. They're, they are completely inadequate to, 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 to live, you know, like to operate um, in, 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 in a complex society. So I think the critical issue here is how do we make sure that all the information we have can actually be put to use in a way which is transformative? And that brings me back to what Janelle was saying, you know, this requires all sorts of, it, all sorts of sources, institutional sources, outside sources, the knowledge of our of our community members, the third sector, the nonprofit associations, and so on and so forth, which is what schools should do more. You know, like open up to the entire outer system and become laboratories of continuous exchange. The, the, the advantage of doing it at school is that you do it with a method. If you do it outside of school, you do it randomly, occasionally, ad hoc. What makes the school different is that there is a method, not just what the information, it's not a knowledge generation, it's not a knowledge generating institution, it's an institution that helps you get method to go through all the information that is already out there. So exciting. On this note, I actually do have uh, a first question from the audience that fits very nicely. And it's from Cohen Timmers, who is a teacher in uh, a part of the Climate Action Project from Belgium. And the question is for Lorenzo, but also a follow-up question for Janelle. But the question is, um, how did you create enough urgency within your government to make such a progressive move, right? How, how such a mobilization was possible? So maybe we can begin with this, and then we have a follow-up question for Janelle as well. Well, I think youth mobilizations um, helped. Um, so there was there was a clear call from students, from the youth, that something needed to change. And the whole idea of keeping school for doing something positive for the climate was a bit of a wake-up call. Why would you need to skip school to do something important for the world? So the point was that schools were no longer were not equipped with the sort of space and opportunity for students to become active within the schools. So schools had to had to change. So we put it very clearly. Let's do something that allows this generation to feel empowered also at school, not just outside. And the second one was the issue of linking it up with civic education. I'd like to emphasize this once again. There is a need for civic education all over the world. It's pretty cross-cutting. I'm sure that people from the left and people from the right would, would, would agree that we need to equip all generations with new tools to understand the complexity of the world, whether it's the Black Lives Matter in the United States, the issue around, which is very topical today, um, you know, with, with, with the court decision um, and that we've seen, um, whether it's about, again, again uh, violence and inequality, whether it's about understanding why so many people are migrating and they're coming to our countries and what does integration really mean, whether it's the climate and the environment. So all these issues are somehow connected and and so and and they are and the issue of civic education became a very simple method to make sure that all the law that we proposed was voted by unanimity in parliament there was not one single person that said no so which is which doesn't happen in general anywhere certainly not in italy and why because everyone saw a bit of relevance the, the environmentalists were happy with the environmental core but the people that were more concerned with uh, law and order, with responsibility, with rights and responsibilities, also saw in that a positive thing because it will help all students and, and, and their families to become more responsible vis-a-vis, -vis, I don't know, not throwing trash on the street and, and using resources more responsibly, but also become more proactive in their communities to fight inequalities, to fight crime, and you know, to help society mobilize. So I think the civic education link is extremely important to get political support and to make sure that everyone understands this is not a theoretical subject, it's a practical one. 
Excellent. Janelle, so tell us a little bit more about the political context in the Caribbean and maybe in Jamaica in particular. And uh, do you feel that same urgency there? And how are you working to generate it? So personally, um, I do know that there have been conversations around um, curriculum reform and kind of incorporating more, um, particularly as it relates to climate change and education. So I do know that there is an effort as to whether or not it's being prioritized and whether or not it's being urgently, you know, um, pushed. Um, not necessarily. I do think that they have been focusing on other areas a little bit more, so adaptation, maybe agriculture, food security, but I do consider climate education in particular to be something that, you know, needs that added um, push that needs to be, you know, prioritized even more. And as I've said before, um, through a lot of the youth organizations, a lot of the NGOs, a lot of those uh, more local entities, we have been trying to say, okay, if, persons are not aware, if the youth are not aware, if, you know, older persons are not aware of how urgent climate change is as an issue, if they don't see it as something that they're contributing to, because, you know, I have had conversations with persons who tell me that, you know, climate change is something that's natural, it's God's punishment to people for um, their sins, so how can I, in fact, do anything to alleviate any of these problems if I'm not even contributing to it. So for me, you cannot have uptake, you cannot have adaptation, you cannot have behavioral change if persons are of the idea that they aren't contributing to this problem in the first place. So the only way we're going to have that sort of change, you know, have momentum building our own action and not just collective but individual action as well is if persons do in fact recognize that they have a role to play in the problem and therefore have a role to play in, you know, the solutions. So for me, it's not even about identifying what the cause of climate change is, but in pushing a message that climate change is happening, what can I do? How can I create a better future for my children? How can I, you know, reduce my plastic usage? How can I contribute more towards um, reforestation efforts? How do I, as a farmer, um, do less slash and burn and deforestation so that I don't necessarily, you know, remove trees that are useful carbon sinks? So again, you have to relate the problem to people where they are, link it to their livelihoods, link it to their futures and that's the only where we're going to be able for them to see the connection see the link see where all these ideas intersect and then you know have them um want to contribute to the solution so for me greater attention is needed particularly in kind of changing the mindset but i do think that there are efforts but a lot more needs to be done and i think that's where you know the more um informal entities as i said for youth groups um ngos have been kind of pushing and hoping to um, create space for empowerment and education as well. Thank you so much, Janelle. It's really fascinating that both of you now have brought up the idea of the intersections and interconnections. And uh, so I'll just push it a little bit further on this and especially ask you to talk about the interconnections between the environmental movements and social justice movements that we see uh, more and more converging around the basic issue of survival as the climate crisis escalates. So how do you see these intersections reflected in a climate education um, in, uh, in how climate education can help us move towards a just future for all? Maybe not social justice, but reframing social justice in terms of ecological justice that straddles all strata of society as well as a human and more than human divide. Who's starting? I think you started. <laughs> you okay, you started. started. Sorry, Janelle, it wasn't clear to me who needed to start. Um, well, again, you see behind me, I've got the SDGs. I don't know if you can see them properly. They're in Italian anyway, but I mean, the SDGs are those with their um, images. They're the same everywhere. Um, any approach to civic education in line with the format that we used in Italy will need to put this at the center of the approach. The SDGs are pretty powerful, not only because they're easy to understand, but also because they connect some relevant dots, maybe not all of them, but some relevant dots. And they show how the interconnections are real in a world which knows no boundaries, you know, like, so um, more and more research has shown that, you know, our impact on the climate is based on, as we said, a fundamentally wrong production and consumption process. 
That wrong production and consumption process also has an impact on society, on the inequalities, on the, on the, on the oppression. Global oppression we have seen, you know, migration is directly linked with a very destructive and oppressive industrial model. And, and the same applies to national frictions and tensions. And again, I go back to what is happening in the United States of America, and I may say the same across the world. And students understand that. The, the interesting thing is that students, when they relate it to their daily life, they get it. They get the fact that um, there are an increase, increase, increasing number of issues and problems facing their communities. And they start connecting the fact that not only is our consumption and production system impacting on the environment, but it's also, also impacting on what on what we have to do as communities to clean up. And often this has an impact on the types of, um, you know, like uh, social outcomes we have and on what kind of communities we build and why mom and I, mom and dad have to go to work so far and they're, you know, like, and then I have to commute back and forth and how much that has an impact on the time they can spend with me on the beauty of my neighborhood and so on and so forth. So they start, again, starting at six, you start slowly but surely realizing that Hold on. It's not just climate. It's about everything. You know that it's about taking care of each other. It's about taking care of our ecosystems. Our ecosystems are not something that is out there, but it's what we are. And I think this small revolution makes them, first of all, realize that um, something can be done and also starts equipping them with a lot of creativity as to what they can themselves collectively do. And I think if I go back to the question, the question you raised earlier, it becomes, the whole process becomes much more collaborative than competitive. And so, which is, I think, the new frontier of knowledge. If we think we're gonna succeed and build excellence by building silos and by taking, telling people do not share information, that is so wrong. We need to build collective intelligence. I don't think excellence can be a few very smart kids and that's it, and the rest is a desert. Excellence can only be collective excellence. That's why I pity, with all due respect, my American colleagues that have so few incredibly powerful and beautiful universities. But then after that, often you have so, such low levels of literacy, which shouldn't be allowed in a so-called developed country. And the same applies to everything else. So it's about going back to the idea of a well-being economy. It's about learning how to build well-being. And well-being is very different from being number one on the PISA um, rankings. Well-being is very different from having the next biggest shopping mall. Um, you know, well-being is very different from being a solo student who knows everything but has got no friends. So it's 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 an it's a very I would say at the end of the day, the environment is at the back the background, but it's a very social effort, and that is probably what kids love the most about it. That's wonderful. Janelle, I would love to hear what you think about all of this. So collaborative rather than competitive. I actually, I love that. I, I love that. Um, and, you know, it's something that we've always said when I um, engage with students, when I engage with youth in addressing SDG 13, we touch on pretty much every other of the SDGs, because if we think about it in promoting adaptation, particularly climate smart agricultural sort of adaptation, we're looking at zero hunger. We're looking at how are we going to build, you know, spaces for persons to be able to access food. When we look at climate change adaptation, again, we're looking at sustainable consumption and production. We're looking at partnerships. When we look at gender equality, and you know, a lot of times it's reiterated that women in particular are vulnerable to, um, you know, the impacts of climate change. So again, in looking at SDG 13, there it, it's so connected to all the other SDGs that in addressing that, it's almost as if we're looking at the targets and the objectives, you know, of the others. So again, there are intersections within all of the addition spaces. I mean, when we look again at, you know, education and the role that empowerment plays, the role that collective action plays, I think, again, as you have um, highlighted, Lorenzo, looking at all of these individually rather than collectively does us no good because again there is a space how do we address gender equality while you know addressing zero hunger how do we create partnerships um for the global goals while ensuring that we have sustainable cities how do we um you know look at life below water while still being able to you know create space 
or empowerment. So again, I do think that, you know, they're all interconnected and addressing one SDG addresses all 17, if we think about it that way. And I think if that is the approach that we take, if we look at it, them as being, you know, all pieces of a larger puzzle, then I do think that, you know, that creates opportunities for us to, as in Jamaica, we'd say, kill two birds with one stone. So yeah, I do see us, you know, kind of taking that approach and making sure that inclusion of, you know, all these different areas is done in whatever activities, whatever programs, projects, policies that we um, do in fact put forward. And again, education plays a critical role in that because in showing the interconnectedness of all of them, we then create kind of more holistic approaches and holistic solutions. So I think that is how I consider and how I foresee us moving forward, um, especially in trying to tackle some of these challenges and, you know, alleviating some of the problems that we currently have. You know, as I was preparing for this conversation, I was rereading a talk, a speech that Margaret Mead gave on the first Earth Day in 1970. And, uh, and that time in 1970, it actually fell on the vernal equinox, right? And that was the idea of kind of bringing everybody together around the kind of natural forces and the kind of the earth's rhythms. And so Margaret Mead actually talked about the centerpiece of her talk was the idea of interdependence as one of the critical mechanisms of sustainability and our survival on earth. And she talked about the interdependence with the natural world of all living things Interdependence, interdependence of our long past in which we have learned so much of the ways of the universe and our long future of interdependence between human and more than human beings and more. And yet it was seven, it was in 1970 and, um, and we, even though she called for it and many, many other people before her called for this interdependence for so long and, uh, we keep kind of tracking into still this competitiveness mode, right? And uh, it just seems so difficult to get out of this kind of velocity that propels us into the kind of mindset of global competitiveness. How do we get out of it? Again, shall I, Janelle, why don't you start this time? Um. I think for us to get out of this idea of competition and I, the capitalism plays a very important role in, um, in, in this idea of producing, of producing, constantly producing and, you know, competing with other, you know, entities to see who produces more. So I think that to be able to, you know, um, adopt a lot of these approaches that we consider to be sustainable, there's going to have to be a revisiting of how we do business. So the business as usual approach is going to have to be revisited and see, okay, what are the alternatives? And to be honest, I do think for a lot of countries, for them, this idea of climate change, this idea of, of sustainability is something that they would love to, um, you know, adopt, that they would, you know, love to um, take on. But again, the idea of wealth, the idea of accumulation of wealth through their current practices is something that is going to be very hard for them to detach from. So again, the idea of behavioral change, the idea of seeing that, you know, my current practices, my current um, methods of operating, yes, they're producing short term gains, but in the long term, the impacts are not necessarily, what would I say? The negative impacts that we're seeing from these do not necessarily um, account or, or do well for the short-term impacts that they're facing. So for me, it's going to require an entire 360 change. How do we still you know, benefit our economies? How do we create jobs for our people, but do it more sustainably that the future generations won't be affected? And I think it's going to have to be a conversation where individuals you know, do in fact start prioritizing the future and not just short-term gains and then see how best we can have a win-win between both because balance is important. So it's not about winning now and losing in the future. How do we win now? win in the future and then create opportunities for you know the future generations to win as well and i think unless we start looking at it that way it's going to be continued destruction it's going to be again 
um, short-term gains now and we end up having to absorb all these problems, absorb all these challenges, and then, you know, try to create opportunities for, you know, um, kind of reducing these uh, uh, um, impacts when we could have acted earlier and reduced some of those. So it's going to require an a, a, a entire change as to how we go about that. Maybe Lorenzo can provide some concrete solutions as to that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, look, look I, I think if I may add something very briefly, um, it, it's not something I think, and this is something that is coming out from neuroscience, from a lot of different disciplines together, but the human being, to put it simply, is like 50-50 collaborative and competitive, right? We've got this embed, embedded in our DNA. Why? Because of natural selection, for two reasons, right? You need to survive, so you have to be, you know, self-interested, but you have to survive by uh, because we're not powerful in nature, you know, we are actually of the old beings, we're some of the least powerful, so we need to get together. One reason why Homo sapiens sapiens has prevailed over other um, representatives of nature, of wildlife, and or other human types was its capacity to work together. Together, you're more than one. So this is, this is, this is, um, so it's in us. It's this natural predisposition is in us. So be collaborative and competitive. What is that makes a difference? It's the outer environment. If you get educated that competition is the way to go, if you get educated in schools that tell you our job is not to give you, to, to, to grow you as, as a responsible citizen, but it's to make you a millionaire. Our job, if we measure success in terms of how many millionaires are coming from certain schools or universities, I'm not surprised that kids are competitive and they will become competitive adults and they will come become competitive managers and competitive everything. We are making them competitive every single day. That's why I, I went as far as to say that schools can be very dangerous institutions. You know, we are replicating the problem. Um, so when you, and this is just, you know, one element. If you think about TV, if you think about, uh, you know, general messages, if you think about advertising, everything is about success at the expense of others. You know, like you seldom find role, role models celebrated on TV that are altruistic, that made it in life by, you know, living more modestly, but because they have more free time, they have other things to do. I mean, I, I pity a lot of rich people. You know, when I hear that Elon Musk sleeps on his couch, I'm sorry for him. I don't sleep on the couch. I have a beautiful family. I spend time with my wife and my children. I'm sorry, Elon. You may be the richest person in the world, but at some point you will die and that will be it. That will be it. So um, if, if you change your perspective, you realize that a lot of people are wealthy, but they don't know it because society has a wrong understanding of wealth. I think when you have your good, in good health and you know, the pandemic is teaching us something about the importance of health, which we had completely neglected. When you're in good health, you have good social connections, good friends, you have a good family, you have a good house, you have the basics. Why would you give up your time, your your um, health, your pleasure to get more and become like Elon Musk. I think I think it's it's a mistake to celebrate these role models. You should have other role models. When we start doing that, I'm pretty sure we're gonna we're gonna um, develop and and raise a much more collaborative um, uh, generation. And guess what? When people collaborate and they share knowledge, they can solve all problems. That is mostly. We, it's not hard for us to solve this problem, but we lack the collaborative, um, you know, that collaborative mood, which is so fundamental to get together and, 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 and get it and solve it. I absolutely agree too. And I think education is a space where we can foster that culture of collaboration and interdependence, right? Because it actually exists in, in our communities already, in our, you know, families, it's usually through schooling where that competitiveness really kicks in, right? But it also, schools could be the spaces where we change the culture towards interdependence um, in really powerful ways. But um, I actually have uh, some really great questions from the audience, and maybe I'll shift the discussion a little bit. So um, there are two related questions. One is from Dominique Bernier, uh, who's a teacher in uh, Quebec. And his question is, how can we ensure that climate change education is transversal, knowing that too often when an issue is everyone's responsibility, it's actually nobody's responsibility? 
and a related question from Julian Curlo, who is on the education policy team with the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. He asks, in many cases, we have failed to include the education sector in the education-related decision-making in international environmental structures. So the decisions on the education are, in many cases, taken mainly by environmental ministries with little involvement of ministries of education, teachers, and students. In many cases, this leads to the lack of implementation agreements in education. How do we change that? Who would like to start? So I'll take the first question. So how do we ensure that persons take responsibility for this problem? And I, I think I had alluded to it before, is that we have to link it back to their lives and to their livelihoods. How do we showcase that, you know, in addressing climate change, you're also addressing, you know, challenges that might affect the lives of your, yourselves, your friends and your families. So again, as I mentioned before, what, you, what we try to do with um, all of these persons, all of these groups that we work with is not to get technical about climate change, what it is, and global warming and greenhouse gas emissions, but we speak to the fact that climate change will affect your yields, it will affect the amount of money that you are able to, you know, um, collect at the end of your crop, because again, it is going to create conditions that are not ideal. So unless you um, have more trees, unless you incorporate agroforestry into your planting, then you're going to be um, impacted by a lot of the challenges that come with the drought. So I think that if we, again, don't have climate change exist as an entity in itself, but link it back to persons, their lives and their livelihoods, persons in the tourism sector, highlighting the fact that, you know, if um, individuals continue to not adhere to building codes, if we do have issues where you're destroying beaches, if you're removing sand from one space to another, then yes, it will affect your job because at the end of the day, if there is a, a, a tropical storm and the place where you work is too close um, to the sea, then there is going to be a challenge for that. If there's a storm and we end up having, you know, large kind of infrastructural change, then we are going to see again where your lives, your, your income, your families, your children are going to be affected. So for us, it's creating that link between climate and people where they are and seeing how best we can reiterate that if you do this, this is what the re repercussion will be. However, if you uh, switch to this alternative, we do see how, you know, you can reduce the impact and then create opportunities for you to strengthen, you know, your individual and collective future. So for me, it's showcasing and as we've been um highlighting before the interconnectedness and interdependence of all these different sectors all these different areas and just making that linkage and i think that is probably one of the most useful ways in having persons take responsibility for the actions and want to actually do things that will help you know to restore um their futures yeah sh sh shall i go um very quickly i totally agree with janelle uh going to be a very sympathetic and, and, and conversation. They, they wanted us to try and disagree, but Janelle and I will not disagree because we're on the same page and everything. <laughs> um, uh, I totally agree with her. Um, I think when it comes to schools, if the question also covered specifically what happens in schools, one thing we did with our, um, um, with our approach was to appoint in each school coordinators of this new module. So it's not that you need to do it and someone has to do it. Each school has the obligation to appoint a person who's going to be coordinating the different modules and the different classes and, and making sure that there is a final report and so on and so forth. And remember, do not forget something which is critical. It sounds a bit trite and, and banal, but it's not. This is mandatory and there is a grade every year. It's not something, it's not a nice to do. It's a must do, if you know what I mean, right? It's something that you have to take seriously. I wouldn't go as far as to say that you can you can fail if you don't you know if if you are not good at that, but it's certainly something as important as any other matter, as any other subject. And on the second part of the question, the one about teachers, I think this is the elephant in the room of the climate mobilization. It's schools and teachers are the long forgotten army of change. I think somehow our society in um, de-emphasizing the importance of well-being and the importance of all these things in this blind pursuit of competitiveness and growth and you name it, 
has also forgotten that teachers are extremely productive. We think often our, our you know, pub, public discourse, our impression is that there are productive jobs and unproductive jobs, you know, and then, and then if you're really ambitious, you should try and become a lawyer, a CEO, and so on and so forth. If you're not so ambitious, you can try and become a teacher. It's, it's suboptimal, but at least gives you a salary. That is, that is bollock, you know, like this is absolutely unacceptable. Teachers are very productive. Teachers are probably the most productive workers in a society. They build the real wealth of nation, of wealth of nations, which is this intellect, human capital. That's what drives economic success. So when we start, I think by doing this, we help teachers, first of all, realize how important they are and also regain confidence, regain confidence in teaching and the whole education process in that sector, which is so fundamental. And I think really, as we said at the beginning, this can have incredibly powerful impacts. And it's a mistake not having involved education institutions in the climate conversation, in the climate mobilizations. They can be the most powerful, you know, again, it's probably more impactful to have climate change education in schools than to build hundreds of thousands of wind turbines. It's important to do so, but believe me, when you look at the impacts, if you do the, the former, you may actually have a much more all-encompassing and systemic uh, effect than, than simply focusing on green energy, which is, I don't want to get misunderstood, absolutely crucial and fundamental. This is so, um, this is so great, uh, Lorenzo, that you brought up also the role of teachers. And uh, because we have not really discussed it that much um, so far, but I'm also cognizant of the time and that we actually need to wrap up this discussion already. But we do have more questions that came in. So I wanted to just uh, give a heads up to everybody that we will take up those questions on Twitter and we'll invite Janelle and Lorenzo and myself to respond and maybe continue the conversation on Twitter. But I think that note on teachers actually is a perfect uh, time to hand over the microphone to um, our colleague Haldis from Education International, which represents the Global Federation of Teacher Unions. So she will have some closing remarks. Haldis, it's over to you. Well, thank you, Iveta. Thank you, Chanel and Lorenzo. This has, for me, been such an uh, energizing hour, or you know, more than that, listening to you. And being a profession, one of the long forgotten army, one of the soldiers in that army, I, I really appreciate your discussion. And I'm sure that my colleagues listening to it also do it. And I hope that all, everyone else listening, young people, activists, politicians, whoever has logged on. Because I think you've, for me, uh, contributed to starting what you said, Lorenzo, correct, uh, connecting the dots. That, that what we aim to do is not to sort of introduce one new separate su subject with uh, a climate title on it, uh, but it's changing the whole perspective and of what we teach and the content of it. Because being transversal means that every single teacher out there Every single student out there needs to relate to this every day and more or less all day through their education. And it's about bridging the formal and the informal. There's no contradiction there. We know that human beings learn from they wake up in the morning until they go to bed at night. Uh, you know, I, I love the, the schools without walls perception. For me, I'm Norwegian. Uh, and I've taught in a, in a context where we had one day a week was outdoor classroom, you know, and it's a bit of the same. It's moving out into either the environment or the community. And it also reminds me of a methodology that we've been using for a long time, you know, like for human rights education, when we talk about a whole school approach, a whole community approach. And it's so it's about connecting what happens in school to what happens outside of school. It's connecting the uh, informal and non-formal learning to the formal learning, because connecting those dots also brings it into a whole picture. 
And you're right that we need to be innovative. We need to be bottom up. That's a good, uh, you know, knowledge of, of methodology and pedagogic. You start what is relevant for your students and you start what is age specific, what they can relate to. And you build that out into the bigger understanding that everything is connected. The dots need to be connected. But it won't just be a rosy picture. There will be pushback because change is uncomfortable for many people. And I think it's more uncomfortable for those of us who have lived some years than those that haven't lived that many years because our habits become very embedded in us. They're difficult to change. So I think we need to listen to our students too. Let them challenge us that yes, you can do this, you can change, we can change and come up with their ideas. They're doing it. They're recycling. They're suddenly, you know, knitting and sewing that I grew up with. That's now popular again. You're reusing your clothes. We've even managed during a close down and pandemic to not go shopping every day. So it is possible. The main dream for all young people is no longer to get a driver's license. I now see people hanging around in hammocks in the, in the woods, sleeping outdoors instead of dreaming of going to a high end hotel. So, Yes, change is possible, and there's a lot happening out there. Although we haven't achieved the systemic change in formal curricula and sign on of all governments, there's an awful lot going out there. And it's about tapping in to that innovation that is there. You gave us some of the stories. There are so many more. We heard some more earlier today on our summit. We need to collect them, share them as an inspiration to educators, to young people that collectively everyone can make small steps and big steps, but it's all the steps we take together that make us responsible citizens in responsible societies. And we will manage. Thank you, Chanel, Lorenzo and Aveta. You are an amazing moderator. And thank you to Open Society Foundations that keep pushing also that this is not a single topic. This is connected, as you talked about, to the whole issue of social justice, of democracy, of being active in societies and creating them to what they should be and what many of us want them to be. I can promise that the 32 million members of Education International are out there. The army is marching and they are prepared to do their best, but they need support. They need support to get the training, to do transversal teaching, and they need the support of their governments to be allowed to do it, and the support of parents and students that they want to do it. But we'll get there together. Thank you so much. I'll remember this.